stark and shake my inmost calm While to that rock I'm clinging It sounds an echo in my soul How can I keep from singing? What though the tempest round me rears I know the truth What though the darkness round me close, songs in the night it giveth. No storm can shake my inmost calm, while to that rock I'm clinging. Since love is Lord of heaven and earth, how can I keep from singing? When tyrants tremble sick with fear And hear their death bells ringing When friends rejoice both far and near How can I keep from singing In prison cell and dungeon vile Our thoughts to them are winging When friends would share Hello, everybody, once again, and welcome to Worship with Redmond Presbyterian Church here on Sunday, September 20th. It is good to be together, as always, uh, wherever you are coming from this day, whether it's uh, across the ocean or across town, we're, we're so glad that you are here with us. Um, it's interesting and, and special that we get to learn in this time, uh, as we've been learning and talking a lot about uh, what it means to be the church. Uh, that we continue to learn uh, new ways that Christ is calling us into this time. And I think one of those ways that we're learning that is what it means to really be uh, the, the, the universal church, the connected body of Christ throughout our, our community and our world. Um, and we see that in some really fun and interesting ways. We know it's hard uh, to not be together I, I hope you know, uh, and you'll hear more about this, that your session and I continue on a regular basis to have the conversation about uh, what does reentry look like and, and what are those timelines. Uh, things are not progressing quickly, so I don't have any news for you, but we are continuing to monitor and, and pay close attention to that, uh, looking for times when we can meet in a way that is healthy and safe and open uh, for all. Uh, continue to look for that information. We'll continue to get it out via email. In the meantime, there are wonderful opportunities for community via small groups. Uh, we have a, a wonderful Bible study coming up starting in October on Sundays right after church where we'll dig into uh, Matthew 25. Uh, we'll continue the racial equity conversation that we started this summer and committing to the fact that this is long-term work that we're uh, engaging with and we want to continue uh, staying rooted in, in scripture and paying attention to, to Christ's heart for us and for our world and for justice. So that's coming up in a couple weeks. Be looking for that uh, Bible study on Sunday afternoons, uh, Sunday after church on Sundays in October, uh, small groups, and our, our food box program continues. So all of these things are happening at Redmond Presbyterian Church. We're grateful to God for the ways that we get to continue being the church in these, in these important times and in these important ways. This morning, our task, uh, and it is a big one and an important one, is to worship God, to celebrate uh, the wonders we have seen, uh, 
to celebrate God's goodness in our lives, to hear God's words of comfort and peace uh, in places where our hearts ache. And so this morning I invite you again to take a deep breath and to hear this call to worship. Friends, God says these words to us, come all who are weary, weary of wealth, of poverty, of power, of struggle, of division. Come all who are heavy laden with too much, with too little, with anxiety, with fear, with anger. Come all who have hope for liberation, for peace, for freedom, for the kingdom. And hear these words. See, I am making all things new. Let's pray. Lord God, we hear those words that you are indeed making all things new and we wonder, is that true for us? Are you indeed even making our lives new? We bring that question to you today with hope and expectation, with longing to hear your words. Be with us now as we praise your holy name. Amen. Friends, let's worship God together. scripture's words, we are assured that if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old is gone 
and the new has come. And yet often, I think we have difficulty living into this reality, right? We cling to our old ways that have not passed, and we wonder if we've really been made new. And so when we confess our sin, we make room in our lives for God's truth to dwell in us, clearing aside a path for this new life to emerge. And so before God and before the people in our midst right now, those people sitting next to you or loving you from a distance, let us all confess our failings, our sin, our participation in uh, systems in our world that are um, hurtful to God's will knowing that we will be met by God's grace and forgiveness. So let's pray together. God, your faithfulness is for all generations, yet we often have a hard time living with you in this generation. We love to look back, idolizing the past while forgetting that we wear rose-colored glasses. We love our anxiety about the future, fretting about our individual long-term security. We love our ideas about you, our lofty words, our abstract concepts that have very, very little to do with our everyday lives. And we confess that it is rare for us to trust you, to love you, to follow you with our whole hearts. And so we ask that you'd forgive us when we trap you in our memories or our intellects. Forgive us when we forget that you are also right here, right now, with a calling and a promise for us in this time and in this place. We confess all of these things, Lord, in your loving name, asking that you would hear the prayers of our hearts. Amen. Friends, Scripture also tells us that the mercy of our Lord is from everlasting to everlasting, forever, from before the beginning until long after our imaginations cease. God's love endures. Know this, above all else, you are forgiven, loved, and freed by God. And for that, together we all say, thanks be to God. Amen. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned.
joy to all of you in all I do. Well, good morning. I'm going to read our scripture for us. Uh, we continue in this sermon series, Hearts Like Jesus, and we land in uh, the gospel of Matthew chapter 5, beginning with verse 1. So hear God's word for you and for me today. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up to the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you, and other all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Speak to God, speak to God. Let me pray for us. Lord, we pray that the words of our mouths and the meditations of all of our hearts would be acceptable to you, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, friends, uh, we jump into uh, this, this text in Matthew, which really is the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. It's Christ's first um, major speech, as some of the commentaries call it a messianic inaugural, mm -hmm. where Jesus really gives us a upside down. When I read it, I thought, oh my gosh, this is backwards day. Um, just a, a totally different frame or view of a nonsensical view, really, of, of life in, in, through a kingdom of heaven lens. Like, and a couple of things I want to point out to us. Dale Bruner does a really good job of helping us understand the Beatitudes in two sections, the first four and the second four. And the first four he calls um, passive. These are sufferers, people who something has been done to them. They find themselves in a place of suffering. And the second four are doers. These are the things that people are actually doing. I would say as we start our passage, and I wonder your thoughts, uh, one thing that came to mind when I first read it is that really uh, this is a list of all things we don't want to be, all eight of them. No. None of us want to be poor in spirit. None of us want to mourn. Being merciful is really hard. Pure in heart sounds like an impossible task. So I guess I wonder as you read these Beatitudes, what comes to mind? What really falls to the forefront for you? Well, uh, I, I love, I love the whole, you know, second part where it just, it's more about action. Uh, I think, I think that's really Christ's, you know, ministry and how he shows us that he's always, he's, he always goes to the people. And, um, and I think it kind of refers back to last week as well, as he went into Galilee to start his ministry there and to call his disciples and, um, you know, this, you know, I think it's about uh, Eric Barreto's quote, uh, where he says, uh, preachers can remind their hearers that the Sermon on the Mount makes more sense to the Galilean peasants in the first century, you know, and, and it's just because of the fact that, you know, these are people who are suffering uh, all the time, whereas for us, it's, it's it might be something like in the moment, like, uh, right, it's, it's, it's the, it's a moment of suffering where we feel loss, we feel, you know, things like that. But then uh, for the people of Galilee, you know, this made way more sense because they were, they felt lost all the time, you know, especially in that belonging piece that we talked about last week and, and things like that. So 
I just, I love that action piece where Christ is going and, you know, really says, you know, we got to do something about it. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I appreciate that quote you, you shared HG from Eric Barreto about this making more sense to the, the first century Galileans, because, you know, Becky, to your point about this being nonsensical, you're absolutely right. Like, and, and that names for me that kind of discomfort I feel every time we read this, because you hear that first word blessed and you're like, Ooh, th this is where we want to be. Right. <laughs> blessed. That's a good thing. And then what comes after that is poor in spirit. Those who mourn, those who are meek. Um, none of those are, you know, if, if we read the Beatitudes as, Hey, be like this, it just doesn't read correctly for us. We think, I, you know, some of us who currently are mourning think, I don't, I don't want, I don't feel blessed. I don't want to be in this spot. Um, for those of us who, who feel meek or who are poor in spirit, none of us would say that's a spot I aspire to be in. And so the, the Beatitudes are nonsensical or, or challenging in that way. And so um, I think it is helpful to realize, okay, to the, the crowd that Jesus is speaking to, this is their lived reality. This is where they are. And he's looking right at them. Like you said last week, he's seeing them. He's, he's acknowledging them and saying, in these places of, of hurt and despair and poverty of spirit um, and physical poverty, I see you, I bless you, you are, you know, you are, you belong to me. I mean, that, that's, those are powerful things, not to aspire to, but to recognize in the midst of those things, Jesus has something powerful to say. So still leaves me with that kind of like, wow, the Beatitudes are, are hard. They are challenging to our, our world today. Um, but, but encouraging when I, when I hear it, hear that permission to hear it that way. I think the encouragement, I agree with both of you. I think this encouragement is also to recognize our suffering and yeah. to put ourselves in a position where we recognizing our suffering, we are less likely to judge other people's suffering and yeah. Nadia Boltz Weber does a really great job. She has a a, you know, kind of a, a, a modern depiction of the Beatitudes that I'd love for us to watch right now and, yeah. and listen to because I think it will deepen our exploration of, of what these Beatitudes mean for us in our lives of discipleship. So let's take a minute and watch that now. Blessed are the agnostics. Blessed are they who doubt, those who aren't sure, those who can still be surprised. Blessed are those who have nothing to offer. Blessed are they for whom death is not an abstraction. Blessed are they who've buried their loved ones, for whom tears could fill an ocean. Blessed are they who've loved enough to know what loss feels like. Blessed are they who don't have the luxury of taking things for granted anymore. Blessed are they who can't fall apart, because they have to keep it together for everyone else. Blessed are those who still aren't over it yet. Blessed are those who mourn. Blessed are those who no one else notices. The kids who sit alone at middle school lunch tables, the laundry guys at the hospital, the sex workers, and the night shift street sweepers. Blessed are the forgotten. Blessed are the closeted. Blessed are the unemployed, the unimpressive, the underrepresented. Blessed are the wrongly accused, the ones who never catch a break, the ones for whom life is hard, for Jesus chose to surround himself with people like them. Blessed are those without documentation. Blessed are the ones without lobbyists. Blessed are those who make terrible business decisions for the sake of people. Blessed are the burned out social workers and the overworked teachers and the pro bono case takers. Blessed are the kind-hearted NFL players and the fundraising trophy wives. And blessed are the kids who step between the bullies and the weak. Blessed is everyone who has ever forgiven me when I didn't deserve it. Blessed are the merciful, for they totally get it. You are of heaven, and Jesus blesses you. You are of heaven and Jesus blesses you. I mean, what a powerful reminder. No matter what we've endured, no matter what suffering we've endured, that you are of heaven and Jesus blesses you. Yeah. It's amazing. 
I think the um, the rhythm of this passage, I'd love for us to talk about a little bit of this rhythm of understanding our own suffering, where we have suffered, and how that moves us to receive God's grace in those suffering moments. And then I think what the Beatitudes are trying to teach us is then to be doers, mm -hmm. like H.T. said, to then extend that grace to other people. This is kind of like an opposite of judgment, pick yourself up by, you know, your bootstraps, yeah. <laughs> life of discipleship. Yeah. Yeah, I think that that flow of this passage from, uh, as you said, you know, recognize your own suffering and your experience of grace to, to then moving towards those places of being peacemakers, of being people of mercy, people, you know, who suffer for righteousness sake. Um, you know, it makes sense. We, we've used that phrase when we were in the Old Testament not too long ago, looking at Abraham, the idea of being blessed to be a blessing, right? And so much of scripture follows that pattern. It's not go out and do all these things so that the kingdom of God can come near or so that God will bless you. It's you are blessed. You are of heaven, as, as Nadia Bowles Weber says. Um, God sees you. God loves you. Now respond to that because of the, and, and, and so that's one thing, but I think what you're saying, Becky, to, to identify with our own places of hurt um, and to understand that, that we have been cared for in those places by Christ and, and perhaps others, the church, loved ones, um, and then to turn outward and, and to be those people who, who see others, who listen to others. Um, that's certainly a moment right now in, in our country's you know, larger culture that is so desperately needed in the sense that um, you know, to, to, to look at the pain of others and, and to say, I see that pain because I've, maybe I, I don't have the exact same story, but I have places in my life where, where I've experienced pain. Um, and so I, I, can, I can draw near to somebody and say, I don't know your story, but I know what that's like. You know, I see you. And so I, I just think, um, again, the Beatitudes are not a very simplistic, like, Here's, here's what to do. You know, they're not kind of a, a very transactional kind of moment where Jesus is saying, do this. He does some of that in the Sermon on the Mount, but this is more of kind of a, a really kind of big picture understanding of this is what it means to, to belong to Christ, right? Is to, to recognize that, that grace. That, that's my, my thought as you say that. Yeah. Um, no, I, I, I like, I like that. This is, this isn't really a transaction. No, this is this is really transformational. Uh, this this passage is it just stirs up so many things, right? Like, uh, I mean, there's there's just so much where you know there's just so much suffering that goes on in this world, and and we all suffer, um, and and a lot of the a lot of the times um, we always tell people, hey, you need to take care of yourself first before you can help others and this is it i mean this is this is really that thing where uh if if you don't know your own story then you mm -hmm. will never be able to help someone else mm -hmm. in, in in the ways that you in the ways that they need right because because you're you're kind of grasping with all all the stuff and baggage that's going on with yourself and, and you know and, and it's the truth because it, it'll it'll kind of get in the way of your helping you know, if you don't know your own story. So I think this is really kind of challenging us to know our own story, you know, get, make sure, make sure that when, when you're called to action, that you, you can go and help fully rather than getting, getting in your own way, like type deal. So I, I, I love it. I, and this is, this is kind of like the whole, um, I, I don't know, this, and this has always touched me, you know, in, in weird ways. And every time I read it, it's always something different and it's always just so impactful. So yeah, this is, this is, this is good. I think that makes sense because I think, you know, when you don't, when you don't know your own suffering it, or even when you don't want to feel it, like, you know it, but you kind of don't want to, yeah. You don't want to move into that space. That's when it makes it really easy to judge other people and even to judge their suffering or how they got to a particular place in life. 
or what their decisions have been. And I think this passage is Jesus. I mean, it's interesting to me. It's the very first thing he said in his address. Like he's, he's shifting the, the feelings of the room, which was the mountain. Yeah. Um, you know, and there's all kinds of stuff, uh, you know, written about how this kind of likens Moses in these mountain speeches, right? Where he's really setting a context of humility for what it means to belong to the kingdom of heaven, which is, you know, that, that we recognize in anyone else's situation in life. Sometimes we judge those people, but really sometimes we are those people and really absorbing that, you know, thinking about, for me, the challenge has been in the text, like thinking about who are those people that I do judge? Those are actually the people that Jesus is saying, you are of heaven and Jesus blesses you. I bless you because none of us are outside of the blessing of God, not none of us. And so that entering, that is something that makes, like that draws me into meekness, right? Without even having to thoughtfully feel like how do I become meek I just you you just encounter that oh okay this is who Jesus is not who I am naturally (laughs) but who Jesus is I I love that line uh again that (laughs) not Abel's Weber said blessed are the merciful for they get it you know and and when she said that I, I I felt that and 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 to what you're saying I think you're right like we I, I don't want to lump us all into this and say we all do this, but it's easy to see other people who are in hard places in life and to say, oh, you know, they they need to they need to learn a lesson. You know, they they that happened because they mm-hmm. did something that 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 got them there. That natural consequences or or whatever, and and to realize like, blessed are the merciful for they get it. This is our opportunity to look at those people and realize Jesus is looking at them and saying, as you just said, Becky, you are of heaven, blessed are the poor in spirit. Um, and to just put those those judgments aside and because as we do that, we we are naturally drawn together more, right? Like if judging is just, and, and kind of grading everyone, I think is another word to say. It's like, well, I'm not judging. I'm just kind of doling out grades, D, F, you know, and, <laughs> and, and to do that just naturally kind of distances us. And so I feel like one of the things the Beatitudes is doing is, radically bringing us back together uh, in a way that allows us to actually be in communion when we recognize that the person to our right and to our left is is hearing those words blessed are you uh from jesus that's that's so important yeah you know uh the one that caught me from nadia bolt's lover the ones that she said the modern take was uh blessed are the um, generous NFL players and uh, yeah. fundraising wives. Like, mm-hmm. uh, I, I have, I, I will admit, I have, I remember back, like, I, I thought, like, man, these people make so much money. They could change so many lives. Like, why aren't they doing this? Like, why aren't they giving half of their salary away and whatever to do all that? And, th- and then, but then that just comes back to say, like, what am I doing? right with what I have you know it's not about you judging what someone else for what they have it's about you you actually looking at yourself and saying like what am I doing with what I have right and and who cares about who cares about the NFL player who, who's doing that like it's not our job to make make sure that they do what whatever they're you know whatever we feel like they're supposed to do with that with what they have, right? It's about what we're supposed to do with what we have. And, and I think I think that's just a wake up call for, you know, especially for me. I'm, I, I, just, I heard that and I was like, oh gosh, I'm in so much shape <laughs> for thinking that like before, I'm like, oh gosh, yeah. That's the same, though. it's funny, the ones that struck us, right? Like I always, I wanna encourage everyone to rewind and yeah. find the one that like affected you, whether it's poor in spirit or one of Nadia Bulls Weber's because the one that struck me are blessed are those who for, who forgave me when I didn't deserve it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I just think of those moments when we do something and we, we suddenly are fully encountering our humanity mm-hmm. and really understand what grace looks like, you know, because someone has extended that grace and, it made me think of this Beatitudes moment I had over and over again in seminary. When I, when I was in seminary, I lived in Princeton, New Jersey. For two years, my 
job, my internship was to drive to Westfield, which is like 45 minutes away, gather with a group of students and adults, then drive to Elizabeth, New Jersey, uh, another 30 minutes away where we would make and serve a meal to like 100 people who in Elizabeth wouldn't have had food if we didn't make this meal on Wednesday nights. And then, you know, I would drive back to Princeton and every week on Wednesday afternoon, I would think, oh gosh, I have too much homework. I don't want to go. It's cold. This is going to be so much work. I don't want to spend this time in the car, but I go and I get there and we do that. And every week on the way home, I would be in tears or near tears realizing like what I was the one receiving from these people. Like they, we, we were going thinking we were providing something for them, but really it, I, it just, it, saturated me in the grit of life and the human encounter and the stories of people and took me out of myself into doing yeah. in, instead of just, you know, sitting on my seminary mountaintop experience. Those, yeah. you know, when I look back, I don't remember studying Hebrew. I remember those, yeah. those dinners that we served and sitting down with people and sharing a meal. So it just is this reminder to me of exactly what, what you're saying, HT and Austin, that, Love that this is a a very different you know a, a nonsensical view of life yeah. and perhaps the most rich experience we could have i love it you know what one more quote from that eric barreto theologian at, at princeton um that i think is helpful because both last week and this week we're kind of coming to that place of here's jesus just starting and and this is earth kind of, you know, turning upside down, radical kind of stuff, big stuff. And he, and he uses this line that, uh, that we ought not blunt the radical edge of this imagination for a world turned on its head. And I just think, I'm so glad that we're starting in these two passages as, as we begin to talk about hearts like Jesus, because it's, it's revolutionary, right? And, and we don't use that word lightly or tongue in cheek. It, it really is Jesus wanting to invite us into this whole scale transformation. Um, that I think your story about driving to, to Northern New Jersey kind of articulates just, just even just a little bit that we don't expect it. We don't even sometimes want it. And yet this is the, the amazing stuff that, that Christ is, is, is inaugurating in our midst. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, uh, one of the things that also, uh, Becky's story, your story, what brings to mind is that we make, we make, these ideas transactional, but Christ makes them transformational, right? Like mm -hmm. for you, it was like, oh, I got to give up my time right now. I don't have the time, right? It's like, it's all transactional. I'm like, okay, I'll just go do it. Uh, I'll, 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 you know, I'll give up that time for something else later. Uh, but then, you know, as, as, as you return back home, you were like, wow, I was so transformed. And that, that's, that's really the experience that, is radical right yeah and it's this reminder of how of how much repetition we need i did that for two years every wednesday <laughs> and it was the same it's like how much repetition do we need we need a lot it turns out this is why this is why discipleship requires like a day daily slogging through and learning uh, you know as, as we continue to encounter it so i'm gonna um i'll ask um austin to pray for us but before i do I really want to challenge us to think about this week, this process of, you know, where is my suffering? Where have I received grace? What are those moments of, of real grace? And then really, what am I going to do? What have I done? What am I going to do for Christ in response, of, in response to that grace, to extend that grace to others? That for me is the call of this passage this week. And I think it's an important one. Great questions. Thanks, Becky. Let's pray. Loving God, we do thank you for your words uh, to us, for these blessings and these reminders of uh, this calling into life with you. We even thank you, odd as it may sound, for the places of suffering in our lives, Lord, that you, that you call blessed, that you call us forward out of. Uh, Lord, be with us as we uh, do the hard work of acknowledging those places, comfort us, assure us of your presence, and call us forward in love and in grace to see the hurt and the pain around us uh, and places where we can be present as only uh, you are able to do. 
We love you, and it's in your name we pray. Amen. 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 Thanks, you guys. Once again, I'm so grateful for our scripture passage this morning from Matthew 5 and our opportunity to explore that scripture with our friends and our partners in ministry from Overlake Park Presbyterian Church. The Beatitudes that we hear from Jesus' mouth in uh, Matthew 5 are powerful and convicting and important words that we do well to wrestle with. Uh, continually. We never put them aside or put them away because they always draw us back to the heart of Christ for those who hurt, for those who are without power, and for those who are near to God, for us when we are in those places as well. 
So this morning we go to God in prayer. We bring our offerings, responding to God's love in our lives. If you uh, continue to support Redmond Presbyterian Church, we encourage you to either click the Give Now button on our website or send your checks in the mail. We're checking the mail regularly. And we thank you for your ongoing support of God's work in our community and in our church. And uh, we look for, forward to uh, the future and what God will continue doing in our church. Let's bring our prayers uh, in whatever condition our hearts are in uh, to God this morning and joining our voices together saying the Lord's Prayer. If you have prayer requests, please feel free to share them. You can email them to me directly, share them in the chat bar here on the side of the screen, or send a, a card via the mail as well. Friends, let's pray. Loving God, we know that you bless those who are poor in spirit, who feel empty inside, and who dread the day ahead. God, we ask that you'd bless those who mourn and grieve, who ache with loss for someone who they love, who they have lost. God, we ask that you bless the people who are meek, who do not grasp or shout or demand to be first in line. God, we ask that you bless the people who are hungry for justice and who cannot wait for everyone to have their time. God, bless those who are merciful, who have learned to forgive even those who hurt them. God, bless all who are pure in heart, in whom there is no vengeance or vengefulness, but only love. God, bless the peacemakers, the ones who by their very words and deeds change the world around us. God, bless the persecuted ones. Keep them safe from those who would do them harm. God, you are so rich in blessing your children. We rejoice in your promises and your boundlessness, your transforming grace. Lord, help us to hear these words of blessedness and participate in your ongoing blessing and those in the world around us. We pray all of these things, praying the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, thank you again for being here for yet another one of our online services. Um, I know this is hard to convey through a computer screen, but I want you to know I am grateful for you, uh, for your ongoing presence here uh, physically, but also for the ways that you continue to reach out to one another, to call somebody in, at, in the church and tell them you're thinking of them, the ways that you're praying for each other, the ways that you're serving those in our community, the ways that you're continuing to care for your families in the midst of this difficult time. I'm grateful for you and for the work that you are doing. As you go from this place today to continuing to worship God with your very life, I encourage you to hear and receive this blessing. Go from this place assured of one thing, and that is of Christ's love, which is greater than you can possibly imagine for you. And so wrapped in that great love, live freely, serve lavishly, forgive abundantly. Friends, go from this place to love and to serve the Lord. Amen. Have a great week, everyone. And we hope if you're able to stick around and join us for a time of fellowship on Zoom. The link is there in the chat bar. We'll see you soon.